Hi, I'm Matt Somerville from Two Blokes Cider, based in Toronto, Ontario, and Port Perry, Ontario, and you're listening to Cider Chat. Episode 152. Hello and welcome to Cider Chat. My name is Rio Wincoller and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast where we speak with makers, cider enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. This week we're talking about how to conduct a cider making course with Matthew Somerville based in Port Perry and Toronto, Canada. There's going to be more on that chat But meanwhile, let's get a little bit of news and updates out and about in Ciderville. Last week, I was driving about dropping off signs that said Cider Days with a big red arrow on it to all the locations that are going to be hosting events at the upcoming 24th annual Franklin County Cider Days. And I feel like I am in like Ciderville heaven right now. It's just like such an exciting week for me. Uh, This episode here, talking with Matthew, sharing with you how I've been able to get a cider making course rolling and some of my tips. And that was a really enjoyable conversation. And then in just a couple days, I'm going to be heading up to New Hampshire and Vermont with some Cider 11 folks doing the New England Cider Tour. Then the next day kicks off this Friday, Franklin County Saturdays, and people are coming in from all over, some old friends and folks that I'm really excited about meeting and making new friends with. And then actually, just a couple days ago on Saturday, I was judging at the Great International, it's a very long name, the Great International, let me see, Beer, Cider, Mead, Sake, and probably something else in there, competition. That's also in its 24th year. Actually, come to think about it, it started the same year that Cider Days did. Isn't that interesting? So, so, uh, so many parallel universes. And that was fun for me because I was judging English and French ciders and there was a nice compliment of them. And I was, uh, really, I was really impressed by the quality of ciders that were submitted into that competition. However, there were a number of Canadian ciders that were submitted were supposed to be coming over the border, but they got stopped at the border and did not make it to the competition. Now, I don't know what exactly happened, but I just want to say it here. That ain't the way to do global commerce if we're stopping businesses from being able to send their wares. I, I don't get it. I, I don't know. It doesn't make sense to me, and it is a total bummer. Bummer for the cider makers who were probably could have really placed for whatever reason. I don't know if it happened from other countries, but I heard that was something going on for Canada, and I'm so sad to hear that. Super sad. Bum, bum, bum. Anyways, going on to happy. Let's stay in happy. Uh, I have some other info for you in terms of cider days, and that is the bulk rate for cider. I believe it's going to be five seventy five per gallon, and this is unpasteurized, un filtered, just fresh press juice that Pine Hill Orchard does every year as they have for the past 24 years for cider makers. So five seventy five per gallon and uh, you would just go there with your, your carboy or your barrel. If you haven't prepared yourself for attending Cider Days yet, you might lis- listen to episode 46 that I put out a while back. That has some really good tips still that are kind of evergreen. And also the most recent episode, 149, which is called Pro Tips for Attending Cider Days. Looking forward to seeing the folks that I met uh, just this past weekend at the competition, Eric and some buddies, and uh, another guy, Steve, who who I met at the competition, who was way into cider. The cool thing about this Grain International, what used to be just beer competition, so many people ask me about cider, and I'm wearing my cider tent chat uh, t-shirt and they're going hey let's talk about cider and really keenly interested and wondering what's happening with the market so that's that is good news for all of us that's definitely a cider going up 
thing that's been happening for quite a while now when I'm at beer events. Very, very thrilling. And uh, it just shows you that we just have to stay steady on, keep the pace going. All right, talking about keeping the pace going, I am going to do just that. So when I return, we'll come back with a little bit more news out and about in Ciderville. This past week, three people became new patrons of the Cider Chat Patreon page. These are not commercial makers. No, these are cider fans. And uh, I was just thrilled. I, I was really thrilled. Thank you so much. And if you don't know what Patreon is, it is a website that helps content providers like myself get some kickback from listeners, uh, a, a monthly donation. There's all different levels that you could join at, and it helps me, in this case, keep this podcast on the air, because as you might kind of guess, there's a bit of work doing that. So I'd like to say a big thank you to Al, Nikki, and Anders. And Anders, don't you know... (laughs) Maria, Perry wants to say something. Yeah, Perry, I kind of thought you might want to say something. Yes, indeed, I would. Anders, thank you very much. We're all very happy that you are now a patron of Cider Chat. I do believe that you do probably have a sense of what the Talking Palms are now. But if you need to know further, all I could say is just try talking to a palm. Because I said before, and I'll say it again, you never know when a palm will talk back. Well, thank you for that, Perry. That was really nice of you. Um, I... I think that maybe you did get through to Anders and obviously inspired him to join the Cider Chat Patreon page. Yes, I did, Rhea. Uh, I think you could give me credit for that, and I certainly will take it, because that is exactly my intention, to spend time on this podcast encouraging everyone out there listening to support Cider Chat. In fact, Rhea, while I have your ear... (laughs) Perry. Well, humans do have ears, you know, Mr. Quince. I'd like to say that I heard that Matthew is from Port Perry. Yes, I kind of figured you'd pick up on that, Perry Pear. Uh, but Port Perry, in this case, was named after Peter Perry, and it doesn't really say anything about orchards there. That does not matter, Rhea. As you well know, the surname of Perry is... Yes, Perry Pear, I know that it's related to pears and all that, but um, Port Perry up in Ontario is is not really associated at this point in that way. But with folks like Andy and Matthew having a cidery up there, that could absolutely change it. And uh, I know what you want to say next is... Of course you know what I want to say next is that I do hope that they are also planting peri pears. <laughs> Shall we move on, Rhea? That sounds like a good idea, Mr. Quince, but thank you, Perry Pear, as always, for putting in your two bushels and a peck. Indeed. <laughs> Going one, two, three, continue on with Cider Chat 152. Take it away, Rhea. Oh, I will indeed. Thank you, Midlars. Uh, just so you know, in case you're not familiar, those are the Talking Palms. We had Perry Pear. Mr. Quince, and the Medlars. They always are behind the scenes helping me in the cider house. Uh, And while we were chatting, in came another email. I was kind of reading on the side, and that was an announcement that there was actually another patron who just signed up on the Cider Chat Patreon page. That would be Douglas, and he wrote this really nice letter, and I'd like to share it with you. He writes, I wanted to say hello and share my hard cider journey. Ooh, I always like to hear that. That gets me excited, hearing people's hard cider journeys. That's what Cider Chat's all about. Which you have been part of unknowingly. (laughs) I was introduced to hard cider in 1996 while working the door at an Irish-style pub in college. The pay was terrible, but the pints were free and woodpecker hard cider was on tap. 
So that's where my love affair with cider started. Uh, He writes, I've brewed beer for years and made wine at our uncle's farm in Pennsylvania. I've always had an itch for making cider. I started listening to your podcast and after about 20 episodes, I got inspired and made 18 gallons. I kegged it and served it on tap on the bar in our great room. So from further inspiration by you, I'm making the four hour drive to Cider Days this year. My close friend Andrew is an organic dairy farmer, and I'm hoping he and I can find a way to grow our apples and make cider in the future, even professionally. Awesome. That's great news. He continues with, your voice and inspiration has gotten me through some difficult times I've had this past year. Ah, that's hard to hear, but I'm glad that I was able to help out, buddy. And he says, thank you very much. All right. Wow. Hey, Doug, that, that, and that actually gives me a bit of a, a kind of a weepy eye there because, uh, you know, podcasts are like that. We all stay connected in a way and having that familiar voice, um, I can relate to that. There's podcasts that do that for me and getting letters like this really inspires me to continue on. Super excited on the fact that you're going to be at Cider Days. I really look forward to raising a glass with you. Uh, Probably the best place to meet with me will be on Friday night for sure. Uh, And that will be at the St. James Episcopal Church where there's going to be a cider pub, bring your own scene. So I'm having some of my ciders there and would love to pour you some and raise a glass and, and high five, you know, high five for all the good, good cheer that's going on, which is really what it's all about. Dang, I, this, this is, this is a, a great, a great way to go into the cider days week. And, um, yeah, it just is, it's just filling my heart up. Lots more to go into, but for now, I'm going to switch gears when we come back, and we're going to get into this conversation with Matthew. So make sure the glasses are filled, and we'll get right back with that. Earlier this fall, Matthew Somerville of A Two Blokes Cider in Ontario reached out to me and asked if we could have a conversation about setting up a basic cider making course. Now, this isn't for professional cider makers. This is for non-commercial folks, folks who might show up with a couple kids in tow, uh, maybe college friends, and just want to learn the basics of making cider. And for me, that's kind of music to my ears. I think it really really brings the the part that made Franklin County Cider Days so popular in that it was not to really get folks to become commercial makers. It was just to get folks interested in cider and to understand the components that are involved. So I was more than happy to have a conversation with him, which you're going to hear next. We get right into setting this up. And so as you're listening to this, you might be an orchardist, someone who has apples, you might be a college professor, you might just be somebody who is interested in making cider. And I think all those parties, whether you're someone who wants to do this as a commercial operation or not, will get something out of this conversation and have an idea of what is involved. So (laughs) I'm just going to like leave it like that and bring you into this conversation with Matthew and I, which we did via Skype. And we begin talking about how cider can be very, very technical. And the basics of a course like this is really three main parts. Keep it simple, avoid getting too technical, and entice newbies to cider to not only make it once, but try it again and again. So without further ado, let's head to this chat with Matthew Somerville of Two Blokes Cider, based in Ontario, Canada. Mm-hmm. 
you kind of delve into the vortex of cider making, and, and it's, it's always just difficult to kind of bring yourself out of that hole and, and kind of say, ah, oh, you know, there are, there are people who are, are just getting into this and kind of backing yourself back, you know, out of it and, and kind of trying to uh, bring it back down to the layman's terms. Well, this conversation is going to help a lot of people who are in the same position that you are right now trying to figure out how to do a course. So it is time well spent. Uh, I really appreciate you reaching out to me and having this opportunity to connect with you. (laughs) Yes, let's talk about cider. I've been approached by a local apple grower to uh, lead a course on cider making. And uh, I thought you might be a good person to message because you've done this kind of work before at the Franklin County Cider Days. And uh, as you know, the Ontario scene is burgeoning and there's lots of people who are really interested in trying their hand at cider making for the first time. So my background is that I've taken the Cider and Perry course with Peter Mitchell. Uh, That was at Cornell, but that's a week-long course, and it has multiple days in the the, uh, the lab. Uh, And when you're you're at that level, you can kind of bury yourself into the details, and I need to kind of bring it up a few levels to make it uh, a little bit more... um, uh, approachable for uh, for the novice, so I thought uh, I thought, hey, you know who's a pro about this? Ria's as a pro, so so I, I sent you a message, and uh, and here we are. Well, that's very kind of you, Matthew. I appreciate pro is not something I normally put next to my title, but I appreciate the sentiment. <laughs> oh, you undersell yourself, Ria. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, before we talk about the course, let's just chit chat a little bit about uh, you took this course and you are in Ontario, um, in the Georgian Bay, doing a, a, um, making cider, right? So let's just give, give a little bit of a background on that. We planted, uh, about, uh, 2000 or so cider apple trees, proper cider apple, English and French cider varietals. Um, those apples are not going to be part of this course. These are going to be, uh, these are, those are, that's our own personal stash. Uh, but we're actually located on the Ontario, Lake Ontario side of the uh, of the peninsula, uh, not up uh, not up on the Jordan Bay side, which is Lake Huron. And uh, but we've got um, yeah, it's my family farm, and uh, and it was just about uh, we're looking at succession and uh, and trying to figure out how do you how do you make a go of uh, of farming on a hundred acres, and uh, and we're within uh, about an hour's drive of Toronto, so we've got um, uh, about six and a half million people. Uh, within an hour's drive uh, in the GTA, so it's a uh, it's a good uh, potential market. So, you know, cider is uh, cider is going up, as uh, as we like to say. So, uh, so I uh, we planted the trees back in 2015, and uh, they had their first production year last year. And uh, this year, they're taking a bit of a break because uh, biannualism, of course. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're just kind of and and, and, we, and we were able to ferment some of our our single varietals uh, this past year, so we're excited to be uh, rolling that out. Congratulations, that's super exciting. Do you have a commercial cidery license right now? I do. We just got our cider license. Uh, cider license. Uh, God, I think it was about, uh, about January of this year. Uh, so our our cidery proper is actually in Toronto. Uh, but our orchard is located in the country, uh, and the reason for that is that myself and my partner, we live in the city, uh, so we're doing our production about uh, a five-minute drive or, or a ten-minute bike ride from uh, our house, and then uh, and then we're managing the orchard um, uh, a couple of days a week, and we have a little uh, pied a terre, or as a pied sur terre, as we say, as a it's an RV that's uh, that's doing uh, doing double duty as uh, as our home in the country. Wow, that's I love that. I love RV living, frankly. <laughs> uh, what, what's the name well, of it? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's fun, but eventually it gets a bit tiring. You're like, oh my gosh. But it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's it's a. Uh, when you're dealing with farms, it, everything is all very slow go. So you're kind of, um, you know, we, we need to we need to learn how to crawl before we can walk. So for us, we're. Uh, We've got this space here in Toronto that we're that we fitted up, and uh, and it's now acting as our as our primary cidery, and it's giving us a kind of a bit of a, a transitional space between the garage, uh, uh, and then eventually getting ourselves up to the farm. Because as you know, uh, you can't sell uh, you can't sell cider from your urban cidery 
uh, in Toronto, unlike you can in the U.S., which is very, I'm very jealous of all the folks down there. Um, but uh, yeah, so our, our cidery is a, is a closed operation, um, and we are able to sell from the farm gate because we aren't making any cider at the farm. So it's a, it's a bit of a catch twenty two. So we got to get our, we got to consolidate. That's the next, uh, the next, uh, the next operation. Wow, it's like you're in two different places at the same time. Um, obviously, so you, if I, if I get this right, you, you have this planting of apples you're not necessarily using that juice yet you must be getting juice from elsewhere that you're making in toronto and selling there is that right so we are using our own juice for uh we so we had our first production year last year from our trees so we we did get a a, a, you know a, a, a i'd say a couple hundred liters off the off the orchard which is pretty good um but that's not going to be part of this uh this cider course like this is going to be it's a, a pick your own grower that's um that, that i partner with uh for some of the um culinary fruit that we use for our for our other blends uh so we have ida red spies Cortlands, max you know you know you got you got your jonah golds all those things uh those guys are going to be the ones that are going to be the juice that's going to be for this course and uh, and then um, uh, and then the Dabinet, the Kingston Black, Yarlington Mill, blah blah. blah. They're all going to be uh, kept uh, kept tight and sealed at uh, at our cidery until we uh, until we get them uh, ready for release. Okay, but I have your address, so make sure that you hide that juice under your pillow at night because I'm coming for it. <laughs> <laughs> we have a security system at the cidery, FYI. <laughs> I'll put my ninja suit on. Anyways, um, so the and the name of the cidery is your commercial label. It's called Two Blokes Cider. Right. Okay. So it's myself and my partner, uh, yeah. Andy Paul. Cool. Awesome. I love it. And I, I love this adventure and um, following along on it. So let's talk about the cider making workshop. Um, and you are correct, Matthew, that it's all about m- a good course is all about making what seems really complex, simple. And so there's a couple different approaches to that. And I taught what I, I, I had a lot of different um, names for the courses that I taught over like the first 17 years of cider days uh like the uber apple experience and uber cider making or cider making 101 but it was always kind of the same kind of group which that is that those new folks to cider making and i suspect that's what you're going to be having at your course and to approach it as such you want to keep it really really simple um, because hopefully by teaching this course Folks will come back again and say, hey, we want to do the next level, which, you know, slowly brings it up. And as you well know, taking that Cornell course, the, you know, it could be a five day, you know, or a lifetime experience learning how to make cider. Right. So why don't. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah right. Right. So l- let's um, begin there. You're going to be getting the juice. Um, uh, I know that you had mentioned uh, in our our. Uh, different discussions back and forth online that the folks attending this course do have the option to pick their own apples, but they're going to be picking their own apples and perhaps getting their own blend from the same orchard. Is that correct? Um, this was their, uh, their approach was uh, they suggested because it's a pick your own operation that, you know, people like the process of going out to the orchard and, you know, kind of experiencing that, uh, and then having the opportunity to maybe select, um, you know, maybe maybe have some some uh, ratios or or like you know, uh, or, or or even just select a single varietal. You know, they really love I don't know Ida Reds. They really love Macintosh, um, and then they produce. You know, they they press all of that. So the question that I had for you is, you know, do you think that there's going to be much of a pH difference, um, or do you think there's going to be much of a difference between uh, in 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 the juice of uh, you know within that orchard, or do you think that uh, each or do you think that we should just do a bulk juicing ahead of schedule, and and then just give them the juice, uh, you know, already tested, already sulfited, uh, or you know, and that's another question: should we sulfite? So yeah, I'm ahead of myself already. <laughs> All good questions. Uh, again, I would keep it really simple. You know, if the the goal for the um, the orchardist is to have people pick their own, that's cool. It's going to take a little bit of time for them to then go pick their own. And press the juice. But that is really experiential, and I love that idea. 
when I was teaching my cider making, you know, 101, I never worried about pH. I just let that go because I felt that was just too complicated. Um, so, you know, from a commercial uh, perspective, a commercial maker, a professional maker like yourself, you know, that's like nails on a chalkboard thinking, what do you mean don't think about the pH? But I, 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 that's kind of the way I went with it, and I've had good luck with it. I, I had an idea of the terroir that I was dealing with, the landscape, mm. and so I could kind of, you know, guesstimate. But I didn't really worry about that. And I think one thing is that um, to to use a cultured yeast, um, and I'm not sure what the setup is. If you're going to have yeast for sale there, people are bringing their own yeast. But I recommend picking or choosing a yeast that is going to leave some residual sugars because when folks are new to cider making, they really want to, they're, they, they, they're kind of blinded a little bit by what is available really on the mass market. And they are also often likening that first cider to that they ferment to sweet cider, like that fresh pressed apple juice. And I have found folks, even though they might like a dry wine or something, they expect that first cider that they make to often be a, have that little bit of residual sweetness. So how do we get there? And um, I, I like to do two demos. Uh, so I recommend that you have your carboy all filled up already and uh, not necessarily somebody else's juice, but you, you know you're, you do um, to like a 10, 10 gallon or even a three gallon, um, two, two different carboys, so six gallons yourself and do the demo and then have people do their, their own to choose from. And you could have one yeast package such as 71B. Now 71B, uh, won't necessarily leave residual sweetness, but it's a pretty, it's kind of like everybody's favorite yeast because it's so easy to work with. So I like using that versus, and it's a dry, dry yeast. So it's very affordable. Uh, in the U.S., it's like under $2 for a pack, mm. right? So that makes it affordable so people can have that option. And with that batch, um, and oftentimes I'll, I'll choose some kids. <laughs> I guess that's legal because it's not alcohol yet. Or anybody, a volunteer from the crowd. And, you know, there's a carboy. There's a lot of headspace. So you, you talk about your, you begin with your equipment. You have the juice. You talk about the carboy. And then wait to talk about the airlock. So don't, you know, the whole idea of keeping it really simple, you just start, hey, you need a vessel for this. Um, here's your, your glass carboy. Maybe people have plastic buckets. Maybe you have somebody there who's just going to do one gallon of cider. They could still do it in a gallon jug. Um, albeit you don't want to have that gallon jug too f- filled up. So it's kind of the, the classic way that people started with wine. So for yours, yeah, go ahead. Just, just a quick question. So yeah. for your 101, yeah. did you provide the carboys or did you provide, did, did, did people were bringing their own containers and their own locks uh, or their own air locks? So that's a, you know, that's a good question for us in terms of trying to figure out pricing. Right. Uh, should we, you know, and I think that might be a good thing to do. So mm-hmm. I don't know, what's your approach on that? Well, there's uh, t- uh, two options. One, often when I was teaching the workshop, uh, I did not provide any of that. I just did a demonstration. So I just had it there. I made sure, one, I started with mm. pour- pouring everybody a glass of my cider that I made at last year's demo or, you know, just something for them to be sipping on while they're, they're hanging course. out watching. And I just did the demo. Um, at Cider Days, uh, we do it two different ways. There's always a demo on Sundays. Uh, where the woman who took over the course that I was teaching does it that exact same way. But there's also on Saturday a cider making course where I think the fee is about $85 and it includes all the equipment needed for that initial batch. So that would be your juice, the uh, carboy, an airlock, and the yeast. And I'm, I'm not sure since I never took that mm. course with them, it might uh, have some kind of uh, other nutrients involved too but i skipped that all when i was doing my basic cider making course i skipped nutrients i skipped sulfites i did not worry about that um because i just wanted to make it really approachable because i believe that everybody has 
in one form of, <clears throat> in one form of in, or another had bought fresh juice, left it in the refrigerator for too long, and didn't realize that it was already fermenting. So I wanted to just start that train rolling down the track. And then they could get it more fine-tuned. And people are going to super geek on it. Cool. But we want to just give them a sense of what it's about. So in that case, you, you'll want to think about that. Do you want to supply all the equipment? That means you're going to have to have a lot of equipment there beforehand, depending on how many people, unless it's pre-registration, or to just to do the demo. That's going to be up to you. It's interesting that you have, uh, you know, you have two approaches. One is to do a, um, a demonstration, and the other one is to do uh, is to have kind of a bit more of a, of, a, of a longer process. Just a quick question for you was, in terms of your demonstration, what's the timeline? Like, how long do you usually set aside for you to kind of walk people through uh, that process versus uh, the Saturday um, the Saturday course, which is a which is kind of like in which they provide the, the, the carboy and the airlock and all that kind of stuff. Right. I, I think both were typically about an hour long because my demo would involve a lot of drinking cider. <laughs> and it would actually go on for an hour and a half and we'd just be sitting around talking. <laughs> I mean, it sometimes went into the night. I, I kid you not. But uh, <laughs> you got to please your audience. Uh, the, the thing is, is that I found I would do the demo. <laughs> it's important. It's very important. Yes. I know. You, you know, it's, you get more bees with honey. But the thing is, you do the demo and folks will then slowly start thinking of all these extra questions. And you'll have people who want to start kind of you know, asking you those questions, picking your into your knowledge bank there. So that's where you get more time. It looks it looks really easy, but then you start tasting cider and you could talk about some of the little nuances that you did while you're tasting cider. And I think that often is where some of the learning comes in. You you show this very approachable baseline way that every person, you know, it, the, regardless of your economic scale can make cider by just having like a jug of cider and then you get the nuances to make it a little bit better it's like making you know chocolate chip cookies do you what kind of sugar do you use what kind of chocolate are you going to get like the cheap market chocolate or are you going to like bring it up a notch and get some really savory chocolate pieces is it going to be dark chocolate or milk chocolate um if you if you layer it on too much i i have the sense that for beginners in this that it could be too overwhelming so that's that's been my approach and i've made my career writing curriculum so i think it's worked pretty well so far um because there's can always be a follow-up yeah well that sounds like it sounds like it might be uh it might be a kind of a follow-up after uh people do their fermentation which is uh leads me into the next question which is Looking at, you know, would you, so you've got, you've got your juice, you know, you set people on their way, you give them the airlock, you know, they've got, they've got their, their cider bubbling away. Um, a month goes by, the cider stop doing what it's supposed to do, and it's all done. So, you know, do you, would you ever consider having a, a follow-up um, session in which uh, you go over the racking procedures um, and uh, and talk about that, or uh, you know, so you think that the, you know sending people away with a uh, or how do you send how do you send people on their way after afterwards? I really can't come back to Franklin County Day, uh, right. Saturday. Saturday. Um, right. uh, you know, we've got we've got a, a nearby people like that maybe can come back for another another session. Right. Well, you do have that option, and you're right about cider days. Um, folks don't come back, and so I would often give them my email, and, and I would get those follow-up questions. But I would talk about that next step during the workshop, what the expectation is, such as um, a lot of folks coming to my workshop, they might be in, in the city. And so talking about where to store the cider now that you're bringing it home, what temperature is ideal there. That is definitely something that you want to talk about during the workshop so that you send them. It's like giving a little kitten or a puppy to somebody. They, they, they have to nurture the cider. And now, you know, they're, they're parenting that. So how do they do that? That is definitely something you want to talk about. I think it would be fantastic if you could have, if you can have a follow-up um, demonstration on racking cider over because you and I could talk about it and... 
we've been doing it, but to actually see it and have it be experiential is ideal for people because it's scary. It's a little scary. Am I going to screw it up? And they've already put a lot of love and care. So if you could do a follow-up, do it. If not, then perhaps like I was doing in my workshop, I, I had some of those hoses there and I talked about how to rack it over, what you want to do. I mean, there's, you know, of course, the other option is to leave it on the lease, right? The, all the precipitants on the bottom. And you want to prepare them for that, too. To, that, that's what's going to happen. It's going to be really cloudy. And as it ferments, uh, you want to have enough headspace so it doesn't blow out all over your dining room table or your kitchen floor. So those are the steps that you bring people through. <laughs> Very important. <laughs> right. So just kind of like think about that really baseline piece. And so, you know, as I'm talking here, I kind of recommend that at this stage, this first year here, that you just do a demo. And people can then get cider. And perhaps you have some equipment mm. for people to buy there. But um, setting them all up, it, it really depends about, your your location and the audience that's coming um you're going to be the best judge of that but you can see how it could get a little overwhelming from the get-go and the whole idea i think the number one goal here is that you want people coming back to cider so what's the, the easiest way to do that is to give them a sense of what it is and if they get jazzed up enough they're going to say shoot i'm going to buy some cider or there's going to be other people that say shoot i can't deal with this I don't have one room in my house that's below 74 degrees. And that's going to be pretty hot to be fermenting cider. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's some of the things. Well, that's, a, yeah. and that, that's, a, that's a very good point. So I, I think, I think, I think, well, I think, yeah, you're right. For the first year, I think probably doing a, doing a demo and, and kind of keeping it very, very, very high level is, is, is the best, uh, is the best option. Um, I actually came across, I don't know if you have this book, Craft Cider, How to Turn Apples into Alcohol by Jeff Smith. Um, but uh, he put together a, a little section on, uh, on just kind of the, the process for, for cider making. And there, there might be a couple of things that we may pull out from this, uh, from, this pro, from this book in terms of um, the steps looking at, at racking, looking at packaging, uh, looking at uh, you know pectin haze, all sorts of all sorts of bits and pieces that can kind of uh, people can delve into on their own or separate, uh, and then maybe you know if people are are still uh, still interested in cider after after you know reading that and, and giving their giving their cider um, a taste, uh, they can come back next year and we can and we can go delve into things like uh, you know uh, cider two hundred one instead of cider one hundred one or offer both. Right. Right. Yeah. So you, you have a couple of good options there. I, pectin haze and all that piece is, is going to, you're going to have the folks in your audience who are going to start getting, you know, fog, foggy heads and not be able to keep up with you because it starts getting so technical. So I think, I think this is true about just cider in the world right now is how do we keep it really simple so it's approachable to as many people as possible. And that is your goal. <laughs> May you live long. And prosper. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Peace be with you as well. <laughs> the, uh, do you see any crossovers between um, you? You came from you come from a craft beer brewing background or the craft beer background, and I was just wondering if you see any um, any any similarities or differences between how that was taught. Uh, or how that is taught, and 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 the cider making process as well. Well, um, you are right. I write about craft beer, but I um, I wouldn't say my background was fully craft beer. It was also wine making. I, I consider myself a fermenter. So with that, when I was introducing part of the the piece of the workshop that I did was to talk about where cider fits into that beer and wine spectrum. And I always separate it. I don't call cider wine. I know that a lot of the processes are like wine. But I like to have it be this its own unique platform to stand on. Because you're talking about this sacred fruit, the palms, you know, the apples. And I like to kind of keep it that way because it helps folks 
adjust their their thinking to it. So in terms of crossover, you're right. If somebody's making beer, they'll know about fermenting. And if somebody's making wine, they'll know about, you know, that you don't have to boil. But now in the grand scheme of things, mm. you get so much crossover that it, it's going to naturally happen. So just roll with it. But I approach it from like the alcohol level. I think that helps folks. Um, you know, wine, I consider, this is what I consider, typically begins around 11% and goes higher. And cider's always staying below that. It could go up to like 9% if you're using like a sweet mead and add a little bit of honey, make a sizer, and can dip down to the 4%. But, you know, beer typically uh, is around 5 or 6%. So I always see cider being in between beer. And, and, and again, some of the beer drinkers are going to be going, heck, I drink a double IPA. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a classic kind of, you know, session beer is a little bit lower. So I actually see cider in between beer and wine without, you know, you know, getting too nitty gritty. It, it kind of works mm-hmm. for the, the baseline new newbie to cider making. So you're, uh, so the overall is keep it simple, keep a high level. Don't inundate people with all the details that, uh, uh that us cider nerds are, uh, love to get into. Uh, and, and the, the number one thing is don't scare people away from cider. Bring them in. Uh, bring them into the fold, uh, as as I like to say. Bring them into the uh, into the cult. <laughs> well, yeah. The cult of cider. The cult of cider. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think you hit a, a, a yeah right right on. Um, l- l- but let's just talk about sulfites um, because you did, did uh, mention that, and mm. I will say when I am in the orchard doing a demo, I don't worry about sulfites. I don't, if I'm doing the demo for my own, because I won't be able to do the demo because I would have to sulfite it then and wait about 24 hours before I do anything else. So I go, I go into that cider zone, you know, I I just believe that it's going to be okay. And I go with that. And that's how I approach cider (laughs) and cider chat. Well, I don't know if uh, I think you're in the same situation uh, in Massachusetts as we are here in Ontario that they've introduced uh, a requirement that all fresh juice now uh, needs to be pasteurized or needs to be uh, sterilized uh, prior to sale. Um, so my this grower that I'm working with, she actually has access to, uh, or she suggested that we have access to a uh, UV filter, or sorry, UV light. Treatment. So, you know, what's your th- thoughts about running the juice through a UV filter uh, prior to uh, prior to the um, prior to the course? I wouldn't do it if I could avoid it. Um, so, at cider days, all the juice that's being sold to be processed and and fermented, essentially, um, that's a, the process. There is it's going to be fermented into alcohol. We don't have to worry about anything that's been on the apples or anything like that. So I try to avoid it because this is one way that I am kind of a purist. If I could get fresh pressed apple juice with nothing added, I'll go for that. And also knowing that that fresh pressed apple juice is going to be pretty darn cold, right? I wouldn't normally pitch a yeast at that temperature, but I don't care. I'm going with the good... Juju energy of the orchard, the fact that I know the apples are smiling upon us. And and I'm I'm kind of serious here. I mean, I'm not the I'm going, <laughs> too, not not that I want to sound too wiggy here, but uh I just again want to make it simple. I want to show them get the juice. I could talk about the ideal temperature a little bit without saying too much, but I'm going to say, look, I'm just going to show you how easy this is. Let's get the juice. We just brought it in from the 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 mill. It's a little cold, but don't worry about it. You could see how much uh, headspace I'm leaving in my carboy. Now, you know, can I have a volunteer who wants to open up this package of, of yeast? We're going to make sure that it's clean, your hands aren't dirty, and pour it into the carboy. Fantastic. Uh, sometimes I'll, I'll have a banana. I'll have a kid uh, peel the banana, have them pop that in there. Um, I don't know, whatever, I'll grab, you know, 
something, bananas and blueberries, whatever. Well, now, you're, now you're just talking crazy talk here. <laughs> well, I, I'm just showing them what, what could kind of go in. I know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah fruit, fruit yeah, cider. But but it's the idea that the the, the cider is welcoming, yeah, well, it's it, approachable. It, 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 I was just curious uh, whether, you know, so that we have, so you, what about rehydration of, of the yeast? I don't worry about um, it. Do you, uh, you know, when you're dealing with, uh, when you're dealing with the package, you don't worry about it. <laughs> I don't worry about it. I really don't. Um, Love it. it. It's just, it's, it, you're just doing it for a brand new audience. I want them to like get it. And that's where like the, the next level of cider making c- could come. And the fact is that people have made it that way right right there you know I, that same juice i wait a year and i bring it back to the next year's presentation and we drink it and it's fine um and i could talk about the little nuances then that i mm. might do differently but you know people back in the day they weren't thinking that way you know the average farmer you know somebody probably on the farm your family farm making cider they didn't they didn't have sulfites they didn't have all that they just let it go wild, you know, in the... No, they took a, a leg of lamb. They, they, <laughs> they took a leg of lamb and threw the, uh, the leg of lamb in the, uh, in the barrel. <laughs> right. Which I think Reverend Nath did, apparently, for, uh, for, one, uh, for one type of cider. Mm-hmm. But, uh, gosh, I couldn't imagine, uh, I couldn't imagine it. it would be amazing to see. I think people were doing... That, that happened because a mouse would get into the barrel or the vat... Or something would happen. People didn't necessarily do that on purpose. We just want listeners to know that. Except for Nat West. He was doing that because he likes to do that kind of stuff. Um, but you, you, I think you're getting what I'm saying yeah, here. Yeah, well, because they're putting uh, it in for yeast nutrients. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I get, what you, I get what you're saying. I think it's uh, keep, it, keep it as simple as possible. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and don't, scare, don't scare people away from, uh, from, from the palm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you if you do that, I think you're going to have a lot of people are really smiling, and then they're going to want to try some cider, and so then you, in that discussion of trying cider, then you could get a little bit more thickly layered on what's happening, but ideally they'll walk away and say, hey, you know what, I, I'm going to try this, and 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 this will give you time. Like the three elements you want to talk about is the juice, the containers that you hold it in, and the airlock. That is so important to talk about the airlock and oxygen. Mm. So if you get to that point where they, um, you bring them through what to expect during primary fermentation and then how to top it off and to talk about topping that off with fresh juice or su- commercial cider that they have, uh, then you, you have succeeded. If they walk away with that idea that they have an I- some idea how to do this, it's great. And if they also walk away with the idea that, holy cow, this could be so much more, that's not bad either because then they'll look at commercial cider makers like you and so many and really thank you for that extra, you know, footsteps that you take to really make fantastic cider. I think because we're dealing with a, a, a relatively local population that, that lives locally, um, I think it would be interesting to to kind of offer a follow up for people who are interested in doing that, you know, as a as you know, in maybe a month or so later, uh, and have people bring back their little car boys, and then we could take them through the next step, which is you know the maturation. You know, looking talking about maturation, talking about um, the, uh, the the uh, racking, uh, and then uh, and provide them with kind of the the next step. Through that process, and it's, you know, it, it, it could be it could be up to the participant question whether they want to uh, 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 come out to that thing, and, and or or if that's uh, if that, you know if, if the first step was was enough for them, so you know they can have the choice to, to go go that little bit further, um, and then if you really want to barrel into it, uh, from the pun, we can um, hmm. we can offer up a third course. Uh, which would be at the end of that maturation period uh, that would be, uh, uh, you know, maybe potentially in bottle, ferment, uh, in bottle um, uh, carbonation, um, uh, you know, your carbonation options. Uh, so that, that, could be, uh, that could be something that, you know, we could, we could allow people to uh, select from, you know, version one, version two, or, or, or going all the way to, uh, you know, three, 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 three courses. 
Yeah, I think that's a great idea. You Again, you know your audience. Um, and if you are going to do that, then I would recommend getting three-gallon carboys and not five-gallon carboys because they're going to be easier to move around and to also, you know, it's going to be a little less riskier that one of those carboys are going to break in transport. Um, they could fit it in a, like a milk crate or something like that because that, that's a little bit of the problem there. Unless you are supplying them first with like a plastic bucket, that is an option. So you're going to have to decide how, what your commitment to this is. But I think it's a fantastic idea. Yeah, that sounds like yeah. I think I think I think providing them with um, with the materials as a startup is you know getting getting a three gallon uh, you know carboy is, is pretty um, pretty low cost and and uh, and airlocks are a dime a dozen so. Um, I think that would really help with kind of getting people through the first gate and everyone's kind of starting on the same platform. Uh, and then we can also come back and see how people's fermentations uh, went based on where they're putting their where they're putting their cider. So, you know, people could come back and we could do, you know, a, a different taste depending on, uh, you know, if some people said their fermentation was really quick or some people's fermentation was a little bit slower. Um, you know, it, that actually provides another dimension in terms of uh, in terms of understanding the taste and and and, and the quality of the, of the cider that's coming at the other end. Right, and if I could, I would recommend. I mentioned the seventy one B, which is a dry yeast. So you don't know how to manage that, um, and it goes dry. People might be a little disappointed. So I often will use a sweet mead yeast, a liquid version of that. Um, and I would recommend if you're going to do something where you offer this as an ongoing course that you purchase a sweet mead yeast and you have like two vials of it. You show it in the beginning what it looks like, but just to make it cost effective for everybody that you double up on that yeast. And, and if you're going to do the demo there that you pour a little bit, you know what I, I mean by that kind of making a starter yeast and making it kind of double or triple or quadruple in size for for your audience if they're signing up ahead um that way it gets affordable because uh yeah it gets expensive Do you have any recommendations for any of the liquid sweet mead yeast providers out there would be a good choice whether it's white labs or um why yeast you know i think either of them would be fine to use it's really what you have in your market there um you might have to purchase it online but in the U.S., it's about ten dollars or so for one vial of that, and that could get kind of pricey for people. That makes your your costs go up really quick. But perhaps commercially, you you could yeah, do that. I don't know. Uh, the residual sugar question is a is a good one, and getting something that does provide a little bit because triple one eight uh, it basically ferments out to be bone dry, yeah. um, and uh, and it can be a little bit of a, a little bit of a bone shaker for people who are expecting something that has some uh, some sweetness to it. Um, a fail safe cider for this kind of demo for me has always been essentially actually making it into a sizer where I ferment a little bit of honey. So uh, I do the sweet mead yeast and then I add um, if it was going to be like a three gallon carboid, I'd probably do about at least um, you know sixteen ounces of of honey, uh, pour that in right then, right from the beginning. And it feels kind of sale, uh, fail safe. And folks are always pleased with the outcome, um, versus going to that really bone dry. It seems like it really turns off people and like, I can't drink my cider or it's really funky. Um, so I've, I've found that really good for cider making demos. That's a good insight. Thanks. Uh, thanks Ria. Yeah. And the main thing is that everybody has fun, including, the instructors too so ha have a great great um time with this and please let's chat again and hear about how the course went and what you actually did decide to do cheers well thank you so much Rivia. and uh say hi to say hi to the palms for me okay you bet i will <laughs> take care buddy we'll talk to you later bye bye
when you make cider for yourself, that's one thing. But when you are actually doing it for other people, it's a whole different ball game. So all I could say, and I want to repeat again and again, is your main goal is just to make it attainable and let your passion be your drive. L- allow it to be contagious. That's the best way. That's how I ran with it. I didn't try to get super, super technical. You could leave that to the professionals or you could have those follow-up courses. And I really want to encourage people to perhaps earmark this particular episode 152, put it in your calendar now and say, I want to listen to this episode again, or look at the show notes as a reminder. Come August, when I'm thinking about setting up a cider making course next fall in 2019. And right now we're right at the tail end of October, beginning of November. There's, this is the time for making cider. And I really want to encourage cider makers or cider bars anywhere that you could do this, that would kind of fit your environment. Get a glass carboy out there, the little vessel that holds the cider and start fermenting some cider. Have it be out on the bar. You know, people want to educate people, the best way to do that is to give them a sense of what it looks like, the process it's going to through. And the conversation will begin. And before you know it, you're off like a rocket ship sailing to a cider heaven, teaching people on how this is done. That's a really easy, easy thing to do. Shoot. You could do that with like three gallons. Uh, if you're really hard pressed, just get a little one gallon jug and put it on the counter and have it start bubbling away. Nothing better than that. Again, thank you to Matthew Somerville of Two Blokes Cider up in Toronto. Best of luck. I want to let you know I did follow up with him. They didn't hold the course this year. I think, you know, enough said about that. You could kind of imagine when, once you realize what's getting involved. But they're definitely going to be better prepared next year. For all you folks up in Ontario, keep an eye out for that and uh, expect that that course will take place. Uh, There's just nothing better than that. When I come back, I'm going to follow up on a little bit from last week's episode. And uh, yeah, I'll be right back. Last week's episode, number 151, was called The Sweet and Sour Side of Cider Podcasting, and it featured a chat with Dave Carr of Raging Cider and Mead, Uh, a wonderful conversation, which was cut short a little bit (laughs) for me, actually in a big way. Uh, You can listen to the episode. If you want to hear all the rosy side, if you want to hear the sweet side, you just go up to minute 50, because up to that point, Dave and I were really, really swinging it and uh, having a good time talking about cider, what he was doing there. And then things changed. Um, A a guest arrived and I was kind of ignored for a bit while Dave catered to that guest and shared a cider with him and didn't extend that to me. Obviously, I let it hang out a bit and um, there was some... not fallout, actually, there's been some great follow-up. And I think that's really what I want to highlight. Because the way I like to move in the world is to be straightforward. And the first off, now I really feel I could thank Dave Carr for helping me find my voice and bring a little bit more truth to the experience that I have in Ciderville with all of you. And I think the fact that four people, just since that podcast went live, signed up and became patrons just shows some of the port support also and the visibility that it has created for this podcast. So there's always a silver lining. Uh, that's what a cider maker has to do every single day is find that silver lining when you're trying to make the cider and you think it's going really wrong and just have the patience. And I do feel there is a big s- silver lining in that that kind of messed up moment that Dave experienced and I experienced. Uh, He has since written to me and we've corresponded and 
poor guy feels awful. Of course, you know, I put it out there on public, but you know, truthfully, Dave, you're not the first person who has done this. It's just the fact that I was able to call it out and I wouldn't have done that with anyone, but I knew that you of all cider makers could handle it. Uh, that was part of the reason why I did do that call out and uh, brought it to your attention and hopefully to future cider makers or people who are professionals in the trade to, to notice this, uh, to, to take it seriously when media shows up, uh, certainly if I'm there in the capacity where I'm recording. Makers should also know when I'm out and I'm not recording and I'm not in that game, I'm not going to be sharing things. But if it's like, if it's agreed that I'm recording it, it's being recorded. And I think that is the honesty that I need to bring out to Ciderville and all the listeners I feel beholden to really showing them what's going on. Uh, so there's always a silver lining, and uh, I I do highly recommend Raging Cider and Mead. There is no doubt. Uh, and I want to thank you, Dave Carr, for providing me the opportunity to to speak up. Um, since that, I I got an email from Cyprus of all places. So again, Dave, this is another way that it kind of keeps on flowing. Oh, actually, before I go to Cyprus, I just got a, a message from somebody on Facebook who said, can you tell me some places to go to San Diego? And I want to say the first place I mentioned was Raging Cider and Mead. Again, no hard feelings. Getting back to Cyprus, I got this message from Nigel O'Connor, and he wrote, a little well, the title was kind of uh, interesting because I wasn't sure what was going to happen, but it said, "Don't fuck with the cider podcaster," <laughs> taking a quote that I said on episode one fifty one, which is true. Thank you very much, Nigel. He writes, "Hi, Ria. I am a longtime listener, first time emailer. I just want to say good on you for calling out rudeness in the face of your tireless efforts to promote cider and its producers around the world in the previous episode." Don't Fuck the Cider Podcaster will go down as a watershed moment in podcasting history. Love it. <laughs> so there you go. You know, it's teaching me a lesson here. And I think that this is, it's really an opportunity that cider has in so many ways that other trades don't have at this moment because it's so brand new. I could really only liken it to like my brother Mark who started a kayak connection in Monterey, California before kayaks were seen at Walmart where you could get them everywhere. He got into the market ahead of the game and as such, he's now retired. Well, I'm not saying that because you're inside, you're going to be able to retire at the early age that my brother did <laughs> with kayaks. But the truth is really relevant for both products in that cider has a potential. You could be creating history right now in every little way that you move about in cider, whether you are a cider drinker or a commercial maker. And that is that we set our own story forward, how we want to relate to each other, how we work with each other, and how we promote it. And the more we're transparent with that, the more listeners like Nigel or other people around the world who thought maybe the same thing but didn't write, uh, how that really moves it forward. This is a key topic for me because this is an amazing form to be able to touch into the lives of so many people. So let me continue on with this letter from Nigel. He writes, I've been working for the past three years to set up the first cidery in Cyprus. It's often been a lonely experience in a place with, as yet, little knowledge of good cider. And Cider Chat has been an invaluable resource in keeping me connected to the wider cider community. And at times has inspired him to keep going. I'm sorry I haven't been in a position to contribute financially to your work, but hope to be able to do so soon. Keep up the amazing work and thank you for all your efforts. Well, I did respond to him and thank, thanked him, but I was really beyond the whole piece of last week's episode, which I feel now is like water over a dam. Uh, I, I wanted to find out what is going on, you know, in Cyprus. Tell me. And so he writes, my wife, Natasha, and I have launched Milsa Apple Cider, and our first batch has just hit the market. Excellent. <laughs> Nigel, 
I've gone for something sparkling, well-balanced and semi-sweet that lets the apples speak for themselves and has plenty of natural aroma. Blending has taken the alcohol back to 5%. I use mostly the dessert apples grown in the mountains near where I live. There are a couple of native varieties, and they're called Cahitsa and Lortico. Hmm, I should write that down. I'll put that in the show notes that I blended in as well. Some farmers are struggling to keep these crops going as they aren't appealing to most supermarkets. So it's good to help in keeping these varieties a viable concern. And he gave me a link to his Facebook page and uh, website, which I also put in the, the, the show notes. So, dang, that is really interesting. Making cider in Cyprus. Who would have thought? That just shows you the power of what it means to stay connected and to keep each other moving forward and feeling good about what we do. So a big tip of the glass to you, Nigel. Thank you for taking the time to write. And I just might get that t-shirt that says, Don't Fuck With This Cider Podcaster. (laughs) I kind of like it. Mm. (laughs) Hey, thank you to everyone who listens every week and uh, keeps the conversation going. I've been getting a lot of letters in uh, more and more every week, if not every day. And that, that just keeps me keeping on. So thank you very much. And if you are coming to Franklin County Cider Days and you see me, please, let's take the time to raise a glass. I look forward to that anytime I get to speak to someone out there in Ciderville. And I know that it's just a matter of time before it is you. This is Rio Windcaller signing off for now. Looking forward to seeing you in Ciderville. Going up, going up. Yeehaw!